Hi everyone, I'm John Friedberg and welcome to Under the Gun. I have really been looking forward to this episode for a long time. Um, when I started this show, Under the Gun, and UB, of course, um, agreed to sponsor the show, I decided that I wanted to do a challenge, which was to win $100,000 playing in UB cash games. Well, the challenge is not going very well um, overall, uh, as far as hitting that actual result. Um, however, from an educational standpoint, it's going extremely well. But the reason I've been looking forward to this show so long is that once I started playing on UB, in the cash games very regularly. I started to uh, come across a lot of the same players, of course, and um, I thought early on it would be a great idea if I could get a couple of the, uh, the better online cash game players on UB onto my show and talk to them. And uh, today is the day, so uh, I'm excited to have on um, two of UB's winningest cash game players. Their screen names are Suffer and Foil Shizzle. And, of course, our real names in person, um, Suffer is Ben Yerushalayim, and Foil Shizzle is Tommy Lutz. So I'll be talking with Ben and Tommy about uh, some of their experience playing on UB, and, of course, what it's like to be a, a cash game grinder, and, of course, a very successful one. And uh, these guys are the people that I've really been, you know, watching and learning a lot from, and have a ton of respect for because I've now played about 120,000 hands or so, and man, it is really, really tough. Not only is, you know, are the games pretty tough, but just the, the emotional challenge and the mental challenge and uh, just keeping patient and calm and not tilting, it's a lot of work. So I have a ton of respect for these guys and uh, looking forward to asking them some questions about their experience in cash games as well as other things that they do on the side. Tommy is also an MMA fighter on the side, so I'll be asking him about that. Really cool stuff. Um, in other news, I want to congratulate Phil Locke on winning what some would say his first World Series bracelet, what others would say his, uh, his World Series of Poker Europe title. Um, it's always kind of been disputed for the last couple of years as to whether World Series of Poker in Europe bracelets should count as regular WSOP bracelets. Personally, I think they should not. Um, I certainly understand from Hera's standpoint, it makes a lot of sense from marketing standpoint to promote them as the same. But when it really comes down to statistics and uh, you know records and things, I don't think they should really uh, be counted as the same thing. It's a very prestigious title, obviously. But again, I just don't think it's really the exact same thing. Um, they have smaller field sizes. Not as many people can make it out to Europe which may not be fair to say because not necessarily everybody can come out to the U.S., but it's kind of always been here in the U.S. for a long time. So, again, I'm of the feeling that it should not be counted as the same. Others differ. In any case, it's a huge accomplishment, so congratulations, Phil Locke, on your first major title in quite some time. So, as I mentioned the uh, my Under the Gun Challenge, let me uh, dive right in here and give you guys an update on how it's been going. The month of September has been uh, quite the rough month for me. And in fact, aside from my very first couple of weeks and probably my first month of this challenge, it's actually my first month that I've been losing money at, at, at any given point. Um, I start, as you can see here in the chart, I have had quite the swingy month. I have, uh, I'm very happy to say though, I've played 32,000 hands and we're only two thirds of the, uh, of the month in. So I expect to play at least 40,000 hands this month, will be, which will be the most for me so far. Um, but anyway, after 32,000 hands this month, I currently stand at minus $1,800 for the month. Um, as you can see here, I've had some giant swings. Uh, several $1,500 up and down swings here. And uh, mostly I feel like I've been running incredibly bad. And according to my poker software, the, the number one statistic that really sums up best why I'm not doing so well this month is my money won at showdown percent. And that is currently 46%. Um, in order to really have a, a good month, you need to be, at least from my short experience, you need to be at around 50% um, money won at showdown percent, which basically means that, you know, at the end of the hand when both cards or both players or however many players turn up their cards, 
um, you have to win at least half of those in order to be profitable in poker, at least assuming that the rest of your game is right and whatever. But um, I'm really running into a lot of difficult spots. I have uh, run kings into aces more times than normal without running aces into kings and winning. Um, I have flop set under set three times this month, which is quite a lot. Um, but yet, I think I've only flop set over set once. So just things that are you know going to happen over the long term of the game have been happening. Unfortunately, it's been more of the downside of things happening without as many of the upside. So I'm actually excited to be down this month um, with about 10 or 11 days left in the month because that will really give me a challenge to uh, to uh, try to at least break even this month and hopefully make money. I'm betting that I will, but uh, we'll see. It's really you know obviously out of my control. All I can do is play as good as I can and hope that I can just run average. My next segment, of course, is my newer segment, which is called Am I an Idiot? Where you guys are sending me your poker questions by sending uh, an email with all of the hand details to underthegun at cardplayer.com and uh, keep those hands coming in. Uh, I love going through and selecting which ones are the best ones to talk about on the show. Some of them are, you know, not as great to talk about. Others are excellent situations. Um, the one I chose today happens to be one of those excellent situations. The hand comes from a fellow named Michael, and uh, Michael was playing live in a 1-2 no limit game, and uh, there's a little bit of trash talking between him and the villain in the hand where um, the villain kept sort of, I guess he had just, Michael just won a pot against him, and the villain was sort of trash talking, saying, oh, well, you, you can't suck out on me every time. So clearly the villain was sort of out to get Michael in this case, um, which can sometimes change the dynamics of how the game is played. Um, but in any case, the villain, well, let's start over. Michael had $450 um, to start the hand. The villain had about 230 or so and uh, the villain raised under the gun to 15 and Michael pointed out that the villain previously was only raising to 8 but Michael had been raising to 15 but this hand for whatever reason the uh, villain opens under the gun to 15 which led Michael to believe that he was sort of you know mocking him to some extent or whatever some sort of nonverbal communication there um, anyway so villain opens under the gun to 15 Michael is on the button looks down at ace queen suited he three bets to 50. The villain insta shoves his remaining 215 and glared and glared right at Michael. Sorry about that. The villain then insta shoved his remaining 215, looks up at Michael and just glares at him. So Michael's question is, you know, do I call here or should I fold? I wasn't quite sure. I went ahead and called. The villain turned out to have pocket eights. I had the ace queen of spades. The board ran out, you know, ace x x, and um, the ace queen ended up holding. So his real question was, was that the right call after he three bet pre flop, and why? Well, um, I think this is a good example of what happens a lot in cash games, especially in shorter stack cash games. Um, and live, you know, more so live just because the games play a little bigger and you'll oftentimes find more short stacks, I think. Um, but yes, the, the villain opens under the gun to 15. I think re-raising to 50 is a perfect bet size. Um, but if you notice that the, uh, the villain only has like, you know, 200, 250 in the stack, once you re-raise to 50, you have to be able to understand that you're going with a hand. In other words, you shouldn't be three betting to 50 if you're not committing to calling off his shove. And if you don't want to call off his shove, then you shouldn't be opening up the action by re-raising. You should just flat in position. Now with that said, I do think that uh, you should three bet and call off a shove every time in this situation with ace-queen suited. Um, the only real hands you're worried about are ace-king, of course, aces, of course, and kings and you know queens but aside from that um, his range is so big and so broad that you're generally gonna make a plus EV or a you know profitable call by calling there now once you raise to 50 and he shoves for 215 it's uh, 165 to call there's about 280 in the pot 
So uh, according to my quick math, you're getting like one and a half to one. I think it's safe to assume that you're uh, probably a, a coin flip or maybe, you know, on a weighted average of things, maybe you're like a 55, 45 dog. Um, in any case, one and a half to one is uh, proper odds, even if you're like, you know, a, a, a 60 percent dog. So, um, yes, you made the right call. Glad your hand held up. And hopefully this pissed off the villain even more. And hopefully he put more money on the table and then you could take advantage of him tilting. Send me your hands under the gun at cardplayer.com and I will discuss yours as well. Michael, you are not an idiot. Thanks for sending in that hand. So let's get to my panel now. As I've mentioned, I have uh, Suffer, Ben Yerushalayim, and Foil Shizzle, Mr. Tommy Lutz. All right, Tommy, Ben, thank you guys for coming on the show. Like I mentioned in my intro, you two are amongst the top winners in the UB cash games, right? Tommy, I know you've also had some live tournament success, and Ben, you've had a little bit as well. Why don't you guys talk about sort of how you came about in the poker world and whether you started with cash games or tournaments and how you got to where you are now. Okay, um, basically I, I started in 05, I think it was, when I was in, in college, uh, po when poker was so easy back in the day. Um, pretty much though, um, I just, just started playing Limit Hold'em. Uh, played played that for online. Yeah, play, started online. Started with with a fifty dollar deposit. Um, pretty much just just ran that up, and that's what I'm still playing off of. Really? And played played the limit hold'em games. Went on a big downswing, and decided it was time to learn no limit. And j just I've pretty much always done cash games, but tournaments have, like you can't turn down the big tournaments. Now you were saying uh, that in two thousand nine. You were chip leader of the main event of the World Series yep. going into day five. Yep. Or was it at some point in day five? I think I was third going into day five, but I had a couple of big pots and I, w I was chip leader. And about two hours later, after <laughs> two giant flips, I was out. Okay. But it was it was fun. So now you mostly play cash games, but uh, oh the yeah. occasional big tournament here and there. Yep. Uh, well, d during the World Series, I like I play. I was, I was playing those every day, but. That's that's pretty much it, okay. As far as tournaments go. And how about you, Ben? What's your story? Well, in the summer of '04, I started watching poker on TV, and I just thought I could do it. I was like, "Oh, this looks easy. People are getting in with kings against jacks preflop, you know, and <laughs> holding. So, looks pretty easy." But the one specific tournament I watched that really got me into it was when Gavin Griffin won the bracelet, and at the time he was the youngest winner. And I was like, "Wow, you know, I'm turning 20 in two weeks. I could do that." And then I put $50 on party poker and was playing the $5 mm -hmm. limit sit and goes which would take like an hour and a half. 50 cent juice on the $5. <laughs> they were a dollar juice. Oh, oh that yeah, was, yeah, yeah, right, it was right. a dollar juice and it would just really just eventually I would kind of lose the money and put another $50 in and then at some point I was like limit hold'em's boring. These no limit ones are a lot more fun and <laughs> so then I got my bankroll up to like 800 bucks and thought it was good enough for one two no limit, you know. <laughs> at the time that was eight buy-ins. <laughs> and just kind of went from there. Eventually I actually got good enough to not lose my money and kind of break even. And then and then I actually joined Full Tilt at the end of the year. I met Phil Gordon at a basketball game and he was like, join Full Tilt and they had like nobody on at the time. It was like so small. And I got third place in some tournament there for like $7,000. And that's where I ended up getting my bankroll from. And how did you switch over to UB? Or at what point did you start playing primarily on UB? I started UB? playing UB in the summer of 2006, and then I played there for a while, and then in 2007 I kind of just switched between all the sites. Like, I don't know, I, I'd play everywhere from Full Tilt, Cake, Stars, UB, and then at the end of the year I kind of tried to relearn my six-handed no limit game, because in 2007 I was kind of sporadic playing Omaha, I was just playing tournaments, I just had no consistent game, and then at the end of 2007 I went back to UB and it's just been my main site since. I just kind of found the most success there and just decided to play there 90% of the time or so. Okay. Well I have to admit something. When, when you and I first started playing, or when I first started playing on UB, which was um, right around the April-May time frame, I hadn't really known about, I, I didn't really like do any research on who I was playing against. I was keeping track of my own stats and my opponent's stats 
And I remember thinking, wow, this guy's suffer is like such a nit, right? And I'm like, wow, this guy's <laughs> playing like, you know, really low percentage of hands. He doesn't raise much. He seems to fold to all my three bets. <laughs> and then I later went back and looked you up on, you know, some site and I saw your graph and I want to show the graph right now. So if we could just sort of put that over the screen to see how consistent of a winner you are. I, I have to admit, I was shocked when I saw this because I didn't realize how solid you were. So you definitely have more of a tight style than right. some of the other players that are also, you know, good size winners on UB. Um, let's talk about style of play. Now, Foyle, I've, or sorry, uh, Tommy, I've never actually played in a game with you with one small exception when I was inviting you onto the show. <laughs> <laughs> we played one hand. But um, what, what type of, you know, playing style do you have? And let's talk about difference in styles between like a real tight aggressive and more of kind of a laggy yeah, style. I'm playing. I'm, I'm a lot, lot, lot farther on the on the looser end. Um, I'm pretty, pretty much just looking for a, any opportunity when when I see a profitable profitable spot. I'm I'm putting the money in there and and going for it. So what's your what's like what's your VPIP and PFR? Um, which means percentage of hands played and percentage of hands raised for any of you who don't. Like it, it depends on the different like. Obviously, on how many people are in the games and stuff, but I I think I've been running around like twenty five, eighteen, okay, so, something around there. So you're much looser than you, Ben. Well, maybe you you <laughs> play tighter in the in the one two games that I've been playing you with. I don't right, know well, how, how you play the other games. I've actually loosened up a little bit, not like dramatically like those numbers, but right. probably more like an eighteen fifteen now, maybe nineteen sixteen on a good day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now. Let's talk about playing different size games. Now, I've noticed you, Ben, you'll play anything from like 50 cent dollar up to 510 and maybe even some 1020. I think I've seen you playing a couple of hands. Um, Tommy, though, you don't seem to play too much lower than like, you know, 2 4, maybe 3 6. So, you know, how, I guess two questions. First of all, Ben, how do you adjust yourself to play as low? Like, how do you keep your focus in your you know, your control playing 50 cent dollar when you're also crushing the 510 games? Well, I probably don't focus as well as I should. Like at 1 2, I definitely sometimes I'll notice myself if I'm just in a bunch of 1 2 games, just doing other things like checking sports scores and talking to people on AIM, and I'm like, whoa, what am I doing? I gotta mm -hmm. stop it. You know, I catch myself. If I'm in bigger games, that like never happens. But I still try to keep my focus because I try to. Like if I'm playing fifty cent a dollar, I don't really play that much of it. But when I do, I want to have like a really big win rate in the game. That's kind of like my goal. Like if I'm in those games, and at one two, I don't know. The one two games I think are way tougher than the fifty cent a dollar though. That's one thing I've noticed. Like the jump between those two stakes. That's why when I've experimented with fifty cent a dollar, I'm just like, wow, these regulars are just way worse than the one two regulars. And in general, the one two regulars are worse than the two four. Yeah. But it's hard sometimes like and if I'm in enough bigger games then I'll just quit my smaller games to focus on the bigger games because it's easier to multi-table smaller games than bigger right. games what about you Tommy um, yeah like I'll I, I, I pretty much try to stick to 510 um, if, if there's there's good games going like I'll, I'll just play all 510s and some sometimes if, if there's bigger like a real good game going I'll, I'll get in it um, but other than that, it's just uh, like I, I don't really play enough tables. I I usually max out at about six or seven tables, so there, there's usually enough action at the five ten games. Um, but then uh, um, if I'm if I'm running bad or just uh, just see a good game, I'll I'll go go down down lower and okay, you know just 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 try to try to keep keep good win, win rate. So if there's ever a day when you sign on to UB, assuming that you only play on UB, which <coughs> excuse me might not be the case, but if you ever go on to UB and you see that there's maybe only a couple of 510 games, would you just play in two two games, or would you then start to open up to smaller limits also? Uh, well, I, I play a little bit full tilt too. Okay. Um, but I, pretty much I, I'll, I'll I'll just start playing playing heads up with people, try to try to start games at 510, and and then. Just, just get in the smaller games. Either that or I just won't play. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, the games have gotten very tough over the years, and lately especially, the games seem to be, like, pretty, very, very tough, actually. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was surprised at how, 
how difficult it is to win consistently in these one-two games even. Um, what do you guys do in order to stay on top of your game and stay on top of the competition? I, I think a, a lot of it, uh, like when, when I was, was just, just coming up in the game, I was watching a lot of videos, reading a lot of books and stuff. But a lot of it nowadays is more like discussing hands with, with friends and just, just, just talking about poker with, with other, other people who like know what's going on. Okay. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I agree. I think talking about hands that come up that are, you know, you find difficult are pretty important with people you respect who also play. Mm -hmm. And like before, yeah, I watched a lot of videos back in probably 2006 and 2007, even some in 2008, but a lot of them just seem to have gotten kind of stale to me. It just seems to be like the same thing over and over again. And there's just so many people making videos. I don't even know who's like really good now. Right. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, I'll still occasionally watch a video just to see if I can pick up something new, but I haven't really read any books in a while. I go through a lot of my own hands after I'm done playing, and then the ones I you know, have a problem with, I'll talk to friends about, and that's, I think, the main way to yeah. really... That sounds good. That's what I've been doing as well, and it seems to be pretty effective for me. Um, okay, another topic, bum hunting. <laughs> you know, you see a lot of people talking about in the forums about bum hunters, and I know, Ben, you've gotten some shit in your time for being a bum hunter. Um, personally, I'm just going to go on record saying I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with bum hunting. I mean, if you're going to jump into a, a, a game and play with opponents that are all better than you to where you're, you're not a you know, plus EV player in the game, then you shouldn't be doing it. So that's basically... You know, bum hunting is, is all about game selection and player selection, so right. I think there's nothing wrong with it. What do you guys think about it? I, I, I agree. Like, uh, you, you're pretty much, uh, I'd rather no one bum hunts and, like, everyone just, just plays plays poker, but you just can't can't do that anymore. And it's just pretty much it's another another skill you have to be, you, you have to have just just be 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 the, the first guy at the at those tables and getting the, the best best seat on the fish and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just you can't stop it, so you might as well just accept it and try to become good at it. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot more people have have done it lately. There used to not be quite as many, but it seems there's a lot more bum hunters now. But I just feel if you're gonna bum hunt, you should at least have some etiquette. Like, a lot of the bum hunters just have no etiquette. As soon as the fish sits out, they just sit out immediately. And on UB, if you sit out for three rounds, you get booted from the table. Right. So that gives the fish less time to even sit back in the game. And there's just a lot of them they will just sit, and the fish sits out, they sit out. And it's like, at least you should at least play while the fish isn't sitting out. Yeah. I agree, and I, sh I should add on to that. I, I do think it's important to have good etiquette. I also think it's terrible etiquette, which I've seen recently a couple of times, where somebody got out of a game and then got back into the game to have better position on a player, right? Yeah. So, you know, let's say there was a seat that opened up to the right of, you know, a fish or Gigi or whoever, <laughs> and you see somebody like, you know, get off the table and they get on in a better position, you know, I, th I think that's pretty bad, yeah, poor etiquette also. It's pretty um, poor etiquette, but I have done it before. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. I haven't done it a lot, because usually if you're in a good game anyways, there's a wait list, but... Usually if I do it, it's sometimes against a regular who always sits to my left. That's like the main reason I'll do it. Like, I hate when I'm starting games and a regular will sit directly to my left. Yeah. And I'm just like, See, I, I, I love sit it across Because then you got another, another, spot, another spot on your right for the fish to sit. That is true, but it's just I know how it's you kind feel of annoying. Though, though. I feel if I'm going to start a table and you're going to play, you should just sit across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. I, I do agree with that. But I have to say, I do get frustrated when there's a good player sitting to my left who just three bets the crap out of me all day, you know? <laughs> or, you know, four bets in some cases, so. But I generally, I'll just like get out of the game. You know, if I'm getting frustrated because somebody's just owning me in position, I'll generally just like get out of that game and, you know, yeah. get in a The thing I've taken table. most offense to is when regs will have me sit to their left. It's happened a couple times, and I'm just like, okay, I gotta loosen up a little bit. <laughs> like, Guy used to, like, sometimes sit with me to his left, and I'm just like, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, I, like I gotta start, too. I gotta start three betting him. <laughs> yeah, start playing more hands. Um, so let's talk about uh, something else which I've been experiencing this month, and I I know Tommy that you've had some experience with this as well. Um, ben, by looking at your graph, which if we haven't shown yet, let's go ahead and show Ben's graph as well. Um, pretty much no downswings here at all. 
But uh, I know I can talk a lot about downswings, and Tommy, you can certainly talk about downswings. You said you had a really big downswing, I think last year or earlier this year. Yeah. So talk about that for a second. Yeah, well, uh, last summer I had uh, 300,000 hands of running. It, it, I, was actually play, I was actually breaking even, um, but my, my all-in EV was four big blinds per hundred below, uh, below, um, where it should have been, your actual been. results, so, yeah. So my, I should have been going up, but I was just, for like three, four, five months, it was just make, making no money and just, just get, getting real frustrated, but it's... How do you, how do you deal yeah. with those types of situations? I mean, 300,000 hands is a lot. I think yeah. I've only played 100,000 hands, <laughs> you know, lifetime cash game. Well, not lifetime, but since I've been like a kind of a full-time cash grinder, yeah. 300,000 hands is a long time. Uh, well, for one thing, that was during the World Series too, when I I, I made made a, a, a big cash in the main event uh, during that summer. So that was was like a at least a confidence booster in the middle, and just just keep keep looking stuff over, keep making sure I'm playing well. Um, there's definitely when that happens, you you start to play bad, but um, just just keep keep looking over hands, and it it just just uh, fix your confidence. Okay. And what about you, Ben? How do you keep such a straight <laughs> line? I mean, you're, oh. you're, I, I know that <laughs> this site doesn't show like all of the hands you've played, but it certainly gives a pretty good example of your results, which seem to be like straight. I mean, do you not have any kind of variance in your game at all? I guess I'm just lucky. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've actually had some downswings this year, more so than before. I think the games have gotten a bit tougher and like my graph this year, like that's just showing like all the hands they have or that they've tracked. But this year I've had a couple semi-significant downswings. I wouldn't say anything like too gruesome, but at one two right now, I think I'm actually on a like 150,000 hand break even stretch right now. But I've done pretty well at higher stakes, so it hasn't really shown up like in the graph. Okay, but I, I just feel I play a less you know a style with less variance. Right, and that's that definitely helps avoid the downswings, and I guess okay. I bum hunt pretty well too. <laughs> so but do you bum hunt little. heads? Do you play heads up? Heads no, I have before a little bit, but I really haven't played like at all this year of heads up, other than when I'm occasionally starting a game. Okay. Now the last question, which is a little bit off the topic of poker, um, Tommy, you were saying before we started taping that you also fight MMA. Oh yeah. So let's talk about. I mean. Let's talk about what goes on, you know, when you're not grinding at the tables, both of you, because, you know, it seems like some of these cash grinders can spend so much time playing online that they just have no life whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But you got a pretty interesting story, so uh, yeah, tell um, us about it. Well, I've, I've been uh, I played football in college, uh, small school, um, but there was definitely no future for me in any football related, um, just playing football, so. I, I decided to start training MMA, and it's been about three and a half years. I've had uh, four amateur fights, um, done one three of them, and I'm just uh, it's just just something something I love to do. And are you trying to pursue that as a like as a career? Are you, are you is your ultimate goal to fight in the UFC? That that, that would be great. Yeah, um, it's it's really unlikely I'd ever get to a point where I'd be making more money fighting than poker. But it's, I, I definitely want to want to get to as, as high, of a, high of a point I can get in fighting. Well, you know, I'm friends with a lot of amateur fighters, and, or and even a couple of pro fighters, and they make more money in their side jobs, whether it's, you yeah. know, selling guns or, you know, working at a <laughs> gym or whatever. So it's pretty cool that you have poker to do well in because, like yeah. you said, um, you know, fighters don't make a whole ton of money except for the mm -hmm. few elite guys that have big endorsement deals. Yeah, exactly. So that's pretty cool. Good for you. How about you, Ben? What? How do you spend your your spare time when you're not at the tables? Uh, I watch a lot of sports. <laughs> <laughs> I go to a lot of games. I try to travel a lot. I, I'm a big Pittsburgh fan, so I went to the last Super Bowl they were in in Tampa. And I'm a big Penguins fan, so the year before I went to Game 6 of the Stanley Cup Finals in Pittsburgh, which they won, and then went to Game 7 and won in Detroit. So I do a lot of traveling. I I actually played lacrosse in high school and then a couple years in college, and that's how I 
ended up getting into poker after I was done with lacrosse. And so poker kind of keeps my competitive drive alive, I think, a little bit. But lately, my new thing is going to the gym a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah? Because with poker, it's just easy. To, when you're sitting down all day, mm -hmm. to, it's just easy to gain weight without even realizing it. Uh-huh. Like, you can just sit there for hours and hours. But I think cash games are better for people than tournaments, really, health-wise, too. Because in online tournaments, if you're grinding those all day, you can just be sitting there for 14 hours a day at the computer. <laughs> and you got a five-minute break where you can run to the bathroom, and that's about <laughs> it. Right. <laughs> at least with cash games, you could quit whenever you want. Yeah, that is the beauty yeah. of cash games for sure. Do you guys have any blogs or anything that you want to plug before we get going? Um, Either of you blog or uh, Twitter, or anything? No? <laughs> the only okay. thing I update on Twitter is my main event chip counts every year, which I tend to bust on the beginning <laughs> yeah, of day yeah. three all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Tommy, for right. coming on the show. Ben, you too. Thank Look you. forward to playing with you guys more at the tables. And, of course, take it easy on me. <laughs> All right, thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Under the Gun. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter at John Friedberg, and I will see you guys next week.